Well, welcome everybody to our, um, our Ice Age Ponds um, uh, talk this this evening. Um, the people with, the, the, as, as it says on the on the uh, introduction there, my name is David Hutton. I'm the project manager, and Beth is the project officer. She'll be also joining in with the talk. Um, <clears throat> the um, this is um, kind of uh, meant to be a, a re uh, a sort of charging of the project. We've done um, uh, a, uh, about two years worth of work on the project so far, and um, we have another three months to go. So we've got another sort of spring to go, and we'd really like to get more people involved and do more surveys and get involved lots of lots more people as many people as we can. Um, just a bit of background to the to the project. The partners. Um, who are uh, involved in the project are the Hereford Amphibian and Reptile Team, the Earth Heritage Trust and Herefordshire Wildlife Trust. Now it has to be said that Herefordshire Amphibian and Reptile Team have been um, champions of Ice Age Ponds for, for decades now. A few people in particular realised that there, was the, there were these ponds in, in a particular part of Herefordshire that was, were really quite special. And they've now joined forces with the, the Wildlife Trust and the Earth Heritage Trust, who have the geological expertise. And we're pool, pooling our resources and knowledge to find out as much as we can about, about these uh, important um, ponds. So just briefly, what we'll be talking about today. And firstly, before we go any further, um, a big thank you to all those who buy national lottery tickets because it's the National Lottery that funds this project and enables this work to happen. So we'll mainly be talking about um, <clears throat> how they were formed, how these Ice Age ponds were formed, where they are in the county of Herefordshire, why they're so important, uh, why they need protecting, and um, we'll also be telling you a little bit about what the project has done so far, and uh, all importantly, what we want to do next. So Ice Age Ponds, what are they? And um, one of the things that, that enthused me when I first got to, to hear about the project was these few, um, these couple of paragraphs here, which were actually on the, the application to the lottery. And they, they're basically saying that um, at a time, that, you know, there was a time when mammoths and other megafauna were roaming the countryside around, Hetel, around Herefordshire. Um, the, there was a glacier that covered northwest Herefordshire, and um, the uh, this glacier, and we'll find out more about this later, created um, <clears throat> various um, types of ice age pond. We called them kettle holes then, but we're found it, finding now that there's a lot more to that. So there are different types of ice age pond. But so, and the big thing is that a lot of them, or some of them at least, are still around today. Um, you know, so you can actually go to a pond where there may have been a mammoth wallowing all that years ago, 15,000 years ago, and it really brings them, you know, brings the, the imagination to, to bear on, on uh, uh, taking that, taking that, the, uh, the landscape back that far, and the fact that you can actually go to something that was created all that time ago. Over to Beth now. Hello everyone. Um, as Dave said, um, we're going to talk a little bit about what Ice Age Ponds are and uh, sort of go into some of the background. So I'm the project officer and I'm a geologist with the Hereford and Worcestershire Earth Heritage Trust. So this is the bit that I really like. Uh, and like Dave, any mention of mammoths and I'm very excited. I know you can't see it because I'm not there in person, but I've got my very special knitted mammoth jumper on just, just because, even though it's off, off screen, unfortunately. So what was it like in the Ice Age? One of the first things to talk about is what do we mean by the Ice Age? In general, we're always talking about the last Ice Age, and that's because of the way ice changes the landscape. Ice coming over it has a huge effect. It's a bit like it's being ploughed over and reshaped and sculpted. And um, because every time it does it, it kind of erases the pattern that had gone before. So it's harder to see what had happened earlier. So the last Ice Age is always the one that's most significant in landscape shaping. In Herefordshire, the last ice age was the one we call the Devensian ice age. 
Um, this was about 25 to 18,000 years ago in Herefordshire. It lasted a lot, lot longer the further north you go. At the same time, it didn't go much further south. So if you are in Devon or London, although it was very cold and definitely an ice age, they weren't covered by ice as it was in this western part of Herefordshire. Um, and the ice age features you see there that have reshaped the landscape are from a much earlier ice age, about 450,000 years ago, known as the Anglian one. But for everything for the rest of today, we're going to talk about the last ice age, the Devensian. And we're talking about things that happened after 25,000 years ago. Um, and what would Herefordshire have looked like then? Well, it would have looked much like this picture here. You've got ice coming down. It's in the north. It's covering Scotland and the Midlands and all of the north of England. It's also along the mountains in Wales. And it's pushing its way down the valleys and spreading out when it reaches the flatter land in the valley. Um, so what's happening here is it spreads out in these big lobes called Piedmont glaciers. Um, these are modern ones, but you can imagine a big, huge one of these covering northwest Herefordshire. Now this is where I have to check that I can get the screen to work. There we are. So where are the bits we're interested in? Uh, this is map of Herefordshire, and it really is the northwest. That ice came in, it came past Hay on Wye, reached Herefordshire and spread out. It pretty much reached the line of the A49 as it heads north-south. So it got to almost Lempster, stopped just short of Hereford, um, went a little bit further south than there, and then the ice slowly retreated back. As it's doing so, it's really reshaping the landscape. The reason we know about these is we're looking for subtle clues. They're a bit like a breadcrumb trail, only made of rocks in this case. And as that ice pushes forward like a great big bulldozer, it pushes forward when it gets as far as it can, it tends to stop and everything it's picked up on route is not all of it, but a good chunk of it that's been pushed forward stops and creates what we call a terminal. So the end moraine that tells you as far as it went. And you can just make out a dotted line pretty much following the A49 on this map. And that dotted line represents the terminal moraine. And you do see that in patches. The uh, clearest example is just as you get near the race course in Hereford, there's a great big hummock and you go down the other side and that's part of that terminal moraine. And then we look for signs of how that ice retreated and as it retreated, what it, it had done to the landscape. So one of the main and most obvious features is what we call this hummocky moraine. As that ice is plowing over and then retreating, it dumps a lot of the things it's carrying. Um, it hasn't got quite as much energy. The weather is warming up. It's not snowing as much in the hills because that's what's pushing the ice forward is snow in the hills in Wales. And it stops snowing quite as much. It's not got quite as much energy. So it retreats backwards. Everything in the glacier is still moving from the hills down like a great big conveyor belt, but there's just not moving as fast. It's not growing, it's shrinking. And as it's doing so, it's remolding the landscape and depositing the things that it's picked up on the way. And we look for those. Um, and one of the really obvious features that you see is what's known as hummocky moraine. And it's this lovely rolling hills. And this is formed, everything inside, if I could scrape the green away, it would be a mishmash. You'd see um, gravels and sands, but mostly lots and lots of clays all muddled up together. Um, and the best way I can describe this is that when you look at it, if you can imagine a basket of eggs, so they're really random lumps and bumps where the eggs are sat in the basket, they're not all even and lined up. That's a slightly different feature. So where we see these hummocky moraines, that's where we know we stand a good chance of getting these kettle hole ponds or ice age ponds. Um, and they have been, they are much more um, pronounced features the further north you go. That's because these ones in Herefordshire have been farmed, worked and had about 11, 12, maybe even 15,000 years of gentle weathering that's given them the lovely smooth profile. Um, I don't know if you can spot, but right in the middle of this is a tiny red dot. That's a person, just to put it into perspective. These can be quite large. They are quite large scale features um, and they give it this lovely hummocky bumpy uh, landscape. So what is a kettle hole pond that Dave mentioned? What happens is as that glacier is retreating, so it's not got quite as much energy, it's still pulling up lots of bits of debris. 
And occasionally, the very end of it, known as the snout, gets left behind. It gets cut off from new fresh ice, if you like, coming down from the hills. What happens is that that bit of ice then gets buried by the sediment still being churned up by the keeping retreating glacier, which is constantly bringing forward new material that it's um, scraped off the ground. And it buries that lump of ice. So that's the uh, top picture. And you can see the next one down. Um, it buries them and it says glacial sediment. That bit of ice is now buried, so it's not exposed to anything. There's no air or water getting to it. It's still a permafrost, even as that glacier is continually retreating. It's still very cold. And that bit of ice is going to melt really slowly. And because it's buried, it's not warming up in the sun, like you might think of a block of ice in your garden doing so. Um, so over hundreds and thousands of years, that bit of ice gets smaller and smaller. You've got some sediment over the top and the space that that bit of ice took up collapses in on itself, creating this depression. And it's a depression that gets slowly deeper and deeper. Quite often what happens is where you get a low point within a, um, a, an environment, that's where water will collect. Because ice and the glacier will have deposited lots of clay, clay is really good for holding water. Um, it just doesn't let it through. So if you've got clay in the bottom, you've often got the perfect way. I mean, if you were building a pond, that's what you'd do. You'd line it with clay um, to get these pond features. And over time, and it is a lot of time, we're thinking maybe a millimeter a year, for a millimeter a decade for peat development. But over long periods of time with that pond existing and things falling in this very deep, deep hole, um, which is why we call them kettle holes. They're very steep sided and deep. Um, will slowly build up peat and over hundreds and thousands of years we get a good thickness of them. Those ponds, although they don't look like much, can have been around for more than 12,000 years. This is a great example, so you can see you can get them in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, in modern ones, um, this one's actually taken in Iceland. Now Iceland is a terrible example um, it just happens to be a great place for taking pictures because Herefordshire at the end of the last ice age um, was very, very cold. I know Iceland isn't warm, but during the day it's often above zero, which isn't true in Herefordshire at the end of the last ice age. It's also not helped by the fact that there's lots of volcanic action happening, none of which happened in Herefordshire at the end of the last ice age, which warms the ice in Iceland. And finally, our ground, as you definitely will have noticed, especially if you've been anywhere at this time of year, is very, very red rather than black. And black will heat up much faster, which means these kettle holes there in Iceland develop over a year or five years or 10 years instead of the hundreds and indeed thousands of years that they're thought to have taken to develop in places uh, across Europe. Um, so it's a slightly different feature. But the sizing of fresh ones, they can be quite small. Over time, the sides of those holes do cave in gently and you get features that are much larger. Um, lawn pool in the National Nature Reserve at Marcus Park is a great example. It takes quite a long time to walk around that one. But most of them are about 30 metres across as a rough indication. Um, it's not a great indication because they're all fairly different. They have their own shapes and forms. Um, that's because the piece of ice that was being buried for them to be created will vary. Sometimes it'll be big, sometimes it'll be small. Um, so that's what gives them their different shapes. Have I made it move? Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, Beth. I, I just got a message from somebody that says they can't see the pictures. So I'm just trying to... Um... I wonder if everybody else can. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Okay. Most people can. That's fine. Sorry, Beth. Carry on. That's okay. So that was the first kind of kettle hole. As Dave suggested, as we've done this project, which is about Ice Age ponds, we start to notice that they weren't all the same. Um, even though Herefordshire isn't very large, it does have slightly different shapes of land. And when we saw them, they looked a bit different. Um, and we started to think there's more, more to this story than just blocks of ice that have been buried by a retreating glacier, which is very much the easy story. Um, and so there, we get different kinds. One of them 
Other kind we see here, this is the Sturt uh, Nature Reserve uh, over near Letton. Now, for anyone who's been near there, it is not rounded and hummocky and has that lovely basket of eggs topography. It is flat, really flat from kind of Staunton on Y all the way over until you're heading near Erdsley. It's a really big flat area. That's because it's the base of a glacial lake. During the retreat of that glacier, and it didn't happen quickly or smoothly, it wasn't one day it was here, the next day it was gone, and it didn't just retreat slowly. Sometimes it would stand still and it would be a bit more snow, enough to keep it in the same place and your glacier keeps moving. Um, each individual bit of ice is rotating round like that conveyor belt. Other times it would retreat quite quickly and then sometimes the climate would get cooler again and it would go forward for a little bit. So it isn't a straightforward process. But at some point um, as it retreated, we ended up with a large ice dammed lake. So what you've got is the hills that you now get Staunton on Y sitting on um, there. And then behind it, you've got the old river Y means that there wasn't an exit there. Um, the, the Y as the thing melt as the glacier melted, got a lot more energy and was able to carve a new path, if you like. The old path went out north. Um, so the ice, the water from this wasn't able to ex go that way. You've got a big glacier holding back the water and the ice the other side over near Kington. So you get this big body of water and the bottom of that glacial lake would have been very flat. Um, and that's what we see at the Sturts. This means that the ponds there are very, very shallow. In fact, if you go in summer, there's pretty much no ponds and a lot of beautiful grassland. If you walk around today, as I did, you need wellies. And there are lots of these shallow pools. They're only about knee depth as you go through them. You run the risk of overtopping the odd welly. Um, they're not very deep. What these formed is instead of having blocks of ice that have been buried as the glacier is going along and they're just on land and you just can't see them, what we've got here is as that glacier breaks off into this big giant lake, um, bits of iceberg are floating round. At various times, the water levels seem to go up and down. And also, if they hit a shallow bit, um, they get grounded. They just get stuck on the bottom. And these are known as glacial gravity features. But really what you get is instead of something that's been buried and slowly collapsed, it's a big iceberg has essentially gone kadunk. And then it's melted a lot faster than you would see. Um, with the stuff that's been buried, those blocks and kettle hole ponds, but it creates these really shallow features on the bottom of what is otherwise a fairly flat landscape. Um, and although they don't look like much on the surface, um, there is more going on underground. We can see the way that that um, ground has been depressed. Um, so these ones um, are what we call their ice age ponds, but they're not kettle holes. I know it's technical things, but they do when you're there. It's a totally different, but very nice landscape. Um, and this is two of the ones from that site. We also get a completely different landscape again. Come on, I've pressed the button. I'm reluctant to press twice. Try it. Hey, right. So this is, if you move to the very kind of south near Moccas and Bredwardine, uh, down into Blakemere, running along Dorston Hill um, on the geological map, we spotted these brown splodges. Um, I don't know if you can see them. You've got the yellow running round. Uh, Dave, can you see my mouse? Yeah, yeah. Yep, excellent, that's good. Um, so this yellow here, that's the river Y now. The yellow is just modern river deposits. And then you've got these brown splodges just at the base of this hill. They're mixed in with what's called hummocky deposits but they're not really hummocky like we see in the north of the area around Staunton on Arrow and Kington. Um, they're clay, they're boulders. There's a lot of boulders and gravels mixed in with clay. It's more boulder than anything else. And these brown splodges are peat deposits as mapped by the um, British Geological Society. And they follow all the way round the edge of the hill, almost like a little necklace. And the landscape, they look different. They're much bigger they are much much bigger and more elongate features and um, we went and visited them uh, lawn pool and mockers park is a great example although my has that been managed really managed that one 
um, and these great big features um, form instead of ice being buried or icebergs breaking off, slightly different feature. Even imagine you've got the hill on one side and our glacier touching that hill and it can't go through the hill and it's not quite tall enough to go over the top, although it tries, it rubs alongside it and carries on pushing forwards. As it's doing that, because it's rubbing against the hillside, it's got a little bit friction, causes it to melt a little bit, but that creates this barrier. And that little bit of melt water brings with it the ease with which it can slide uh, and also creates a place where you're likely to get flowing water. Even within a glacier, you get flowing water. And when they flow, these uh, channels, they don't just flow underneath the glacier, they flow in it and over the top of it, sometimes diving through it, they'll go through the middle, they'll hit the bottom and scour out some of the floor. And then because they've got all their pressure from this uh, river, and it is a river running through, um, is coming from the height of the mountains in Wales. It's got a lot of pressure behind it, which means unusually for a river, they can flow uphill. So within the ice, they'll hit the ground, scour something out and then go back up and into the ice again. Where they've scoured out, they leave these long depressions and then they hit either something hard or there's something within the ice obstructing them. And that channel, that river flows back up again. And then you don't see any sign of it on the ground and then it will bob down again at a later point. And that's how these have formed. So what you've got is something scouring out the base and then not scouring out and then scouring out the base. So each one of these is the point at which that river flowing with inside the glacier has hit the bottom, scoured out a patch. And then this bit here is where that river is now flowing either in the middle of the ice or even on top. And then once again, flowing in the ice. All that water flowing around and the fact that it's right next to the hillside means instead of it being mostly clay with some boulders, it's mostly boulders with some clay because it acts almost as like a gutter for all the debris that have come and been flowing within that glacier. They kind of end up rolling there, if you like. Uh, it's sort of rolling within ice, but yeah. So when we get there, actually you try digging down, mostly what you find. If you're not in the middle of one of these peat bits, uh, mostly what you find is big boulders um, and there are lots of them. So it's just another way, but as soon as that ice retreats, it leaves behind the landscape um, with these shallow depressions. Although unlike the kettle holes we see in the north or the uh, depressions the side, these aren't getting deeper or larger, but they were created by the ice. And then their story from then on, the way over time we get life developing in them, we get vegetation building up and then animals moving in. That story is exactly the same. It's just a slightly different way of the ice forming them. But these features we see, uh, at the various sites and they do all look ever so slightly different. So I'm passing over to Dave now about why we're excited about these. Okay, thanks Beth. Um, <clears throat> so you've got a sort of potted history of, of, the, um, of the ponds, the various ponds and how they were formed, um, but because of their, um, they've been around for this and length of time, they represent a, an e ecological and geological ecosystem which has survived for for that long, for fifteen thousand years. Um, and they're also very distribu uh, their distribution is very restricted in an, in, in a national sense. So it's only those areas that were glaciated last, i.e., the last fifty to twenty thousand years. Um, so and north northwest Herefordshire is one of those. And also, it's worth um, worth knowing that nationally, um, less than two percent of lowland ponds are of natural origin. But when you come into this part of Her Herefordshire, that figure goes up to about twenty five percent. And because of that, that, that naturalness, they have um, uh, species rich assemblages, which include rare and protected species. M more in 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 greater. Um, uh, they occur, or rather rich ponds occur more frequently per pond than they, they would do elsewhere. Um, so also because of the way these uh, ponds were formed, um, the density of them within the hummocky moraine areas is also very high, which is also a, a very useful thing from an ecological point of view. More of that later. Um, 
one of the reasons we're doing this project is that um, ice age ponds are, are endangered because um, particularly in the second half of the 20th century, a lot of them have been lost. So just running through a very few examples of, of the sort of thing which we find in, in ice age ponds. Um, none, they're not always exclusively found in ice age ponds. It's just that we, we're finding that in, in this part of the world, um, there, are there are certain species which seem to be much more, which seem to occur in ice age ponds only and much less frequently in, in not ice in ponds that aren't. So this top one, Agabus undulatus, it hasn't got a common name, but this one was found by our ecologists in one of the ponds that we did surveys on a couple of years ago. And it's, um, it's a species that um, has its a population in, in West Herefordshire. And then the next population is is the other side of Cambridgeshire, is the other side of Cambridge, so it's you know hundreds of miles away. Um, and all in that part of Cambridgeshire and, and Norfolk, they also get ice age ponds. So it's um that's uh, uh, one of the theories is that it's it's kind of an ice age relic. The medicinal leech, likewise, um, has been found in a couple of ponds which were thought to have been of uh, ice age origin. And this one at the bottom with a it um, glories in the splendid name of Graphodurus cinereus. Um, it was found in, in lawn, the lawn pool, which you've just seen a photograph of. Um, and that is, uh, is incredibly rare in the UK. And um, lovely, a lovely little flower. Um, one of the one of the umbellifers, tubular water drop, but is again, and I've seen it myself, some of the some of the ponds that we go to this is actually can be quite abundant. And ecologists here, local ecologists tell me that they don't, you don't see them, although they're very much associated with these ice age ponds and the marshy areas around the ice age ponds. Bladderwort is another quite a rare plant. It, it's only found in Herefordshire in, in, uh, in ice age ponds, in, in, in fact, in Lawn Pool. Bog bean, that, that one of the first pictures that Beth showed you of a, of a, of a kettle hole um, was there was a, a big raft of a plant in the middle and that plant was bog bean and again very much associated in this part of the world with with, with um, ice age ponds and Beth also mentioned the um, the fact that they are very shallow quite often they're very shallow and because they're, they're very shallow they often dry out at least what well, sometimes all of the pond dries out in summer and certainly most in most cases there's always a drawdown zone um, so on the the outsides of the pond get quite dry because they're shallow um, and species like these two here the orange foxtail and the sp slender spike brush are specialists in in um, in those sorts of habitats and again they're, they're very much associated with with ice age ponds the, i've seen some nice questions coming up on the on the um on the on the on the um, chat, and we'll we'll get to those later. Thank you for those. Did I do two? Anyway, here's a here's a lovely one. The the ecologists get very excited about these. This is probably less than the size of your little fingernail. Um, <clears throat> it's a mud snail, but very very rare. And these are found at the uh, the, the the nature reserve in the ponds that we looked at earlier, the sturts. Um, again, very quite restricted in their in their being, and they could have been around, and they seem to be um, associated with ice age ponds in Herefordshire as well. So they could have been around for, the, for thousands of years too. Gener more generally, amphibians, because as I said, one of the reasons or it, where ponds are quite close together and in good numbers that habitat as a whole, that landscape with lots of ponds in it, makes it very favourable for lots of amphibians, particularly things like the Great Crested Newt, which um, is very vulnerable to predation by fish. So where you get a number of ponds which have different habitats, some of which dry out occasionally, some of which are permanent. Um, but the fact that um, the ponds that dry out occasionally won't, won't uh, have a fish population makes them very favourable for for breeding, for breeding newts and amphibians generally. And again, generally, um, this is, happens to be an emerald damselfly, but just the coming to a point about the ponds in 
ponds, uh, ice age ponds being very biodiverse, but ponds in general are also very biodiverse. And um, don't worry too much about all the writing, but just look at those two um, bar charts there. And uh, essentially it's a comparison of various freshwater bodies in, in the UK from ditches, streams, lakes and rivers, lakes, rivers and ponds. And per, per, um, per unit area, the ponds always score much higher in terms of species richness. So um, again, I'll say this again, but do you want to improve the, the wildlife of, a, of an area, put a pond in if you can. Um, and here's a, a nice, that, that previous slide was from um, the European Pond Conservation Network, which is a, an international uh, organization looking at ponds in particular and trying to raise the profile of them. This one's from the Freshwater Habitats Trust. And you've got kind of good news on the left, sorry, bad news on the left and slightly better news on the right. Um, a, an astonishing um, statistic there, 50% of the UK's ponds were lost in the 20th century. 80, and 80% 80 of those that remain are in a pretty poor state. Um, better news is that, or an interesting fact is that two thirds of all freshwater species are supported by ponds. And this is arguable, but because they're small, it's relatively easy to keep them clean and pristine for the long term. I suppose you could argue that because there, there's a relatively small area around it, it is possible to have some control uh, over the land around it and, and um, enable them not to be polluted. Um, easier said than done. Um, some of the pond losses, um, uh, thankfully this sort of thing doesn't happen so much now, but this wasn't that long ago and the, this was a very nice pond and it got filled in illegally by a um, uh, the landowner who was uh, making money essentially out of filling it full of hardcore and rubble. This is a historic example showing the case quite uh, graphically. The, the photo on the left in black and white, probably taken around about uh, the 40s or the 50s, um, shows a network of ponds in the, those fields there. And the one on the right is the same piece of land um, probably 10 years ago. And you see the loss of pond habitat there. This field, this squarish field had um, empty. So there's there's a hundred percent loss of the pond habitat there, and there's one or two big water bodies left, but the majority of those small ones and the connectivity between them has all disappeared. So um, a bit about the project and what we've been doing. Um, so essentially, in in a nutshell, we were have been recruiting and training volunteers. We've been surveying sites. Uh, using desk-based techniques and ground surveys. More about all of these uh, in, in, later um, in more detail. We've been talking to the stakeholders, the, the landowners that own them, the uh, stakeholders like uh, Natural England, like um, uh, the, uh, um, NFU and um, land agents, and everybody that has a, an interest in, in the land and what's on it. We've been preparing management plans for a, for a number of ponds, in order to carry out conservation management. We've been restoring a couple of uh, ghost ponds, uh, which were ponds that have been filled in in the past and we've tried to uh, restore them. We've um, run uh, a workshop aimed at farmers and landowners and land advisors to, to again, raise awareness of the importance of the ponds. We've been doing some work on water quality and land use and going into schools and telling children about uh, about these about these ponds generally and about ice age the ice age uh, as well and <clears throat> interpretation basically getting the message out there with um with leaflets and and a booklet which we're we're still producing at the moment is that you beth or is it is me yeah yes over to you beth so um one of the things that they've mentioned is that about 25 percent of the ponds in herefordshire our ice age and it's one of the things that it seems to be a fairly uh, the percentages lost and also where these formed seem to be plucked numbers plucked a good guess but without knowing how big they were or how many there were so one of the big things for this project was we wanted to find out more about these ponds uh, as they've mentioned there are lots of them 
that are susceptible. They've either been lost or people don't know that they're Ice Age. It's very easy to say. But when you walk to them, even the most beautiful example, when you walk across these sites, you're not looking going, I reckon that's 12,000 years old. It doesn't leap to mind. It's not immediately apparent. And it's not something that I think anyone, um, unless you are looking for it, is going to guess. So it was very easy for us to say there are lots of them, but we didn't really have numbers. We didn't have the details. So we've done an awful lot of different types of pond surveys. Um, the other thing that is worth saying is that whenever anyone talks about ponds, the image that conjures up in your head and indeed everyone's head is this thing that's much more either like a grand estate pond with lots of lilies and it's all very immaculate and groomed or a small garden pond. And a lot of the ponds we have don't look anything like that. Many of them are only wet for a couple of maybe three, six months of the year. And the rest of the time, they're just field um, or they vary. They're very shallow and they can go from being quite small, not much bigger than a puddle, right the way up to these quite large features. With that level of variety, um, it's not surprising that people haven't necessarily noticed them. Um, but that variety is important. And the fact that they change size and shape. Um, again, has lots of potential for them to be really rich in wildlife. So one of the things we wanted to do was find out about them. What have we got? Where are they? Um, and then looking at them in more detail. So we've been doing all sorts of different kinds of surveys. With the last two years, um, things have been more complicated than we had envisaged when we got given our funding, I think it's fair to say. So the first thing we did is we set about, um, and we wanted to bring together, one of the reasons we've worked as a partnership um, is because we have mixed experience. So you've got the um, Wildlife Trust and the Amphibian and Reptile Trust who know the area and they are really, really keen and enthusiastic. But wildlife and amphibian and reptiles is their thing. But actually saying, is this Ice Age? That's a geology feature. So what we wanted to do was bring together both of those and all of us work together to talk about what wildlife, the landscape and the history and the longer term history of these sites and look at how we can work together to help them be managed in the future. So we start off with amazing volunteers. Can't say without our awesome volunteers, none of this would have been achievable. Um, so what we did was we set about creating various things to try and record them. Uh, and then we can use that data to uh, create management plans, uh, share data, compare with other parts of the country. So it took quite a long time. So the various things we did, we created our standard pond survey. Um, I'm just going to hope that, that wake up. Yeah, this one. So it's a fairly simple form. It, I say simple, it is five pages. And on it, we ask questions about how much shade is there. There's lots of ecological questions. What's the land use? Can you see lots of different things living in the pond? You get to do a bit of pond dipping, which is always nice. Um, how big is it? What kind of plants can you see? And it's not identifying every species. It's just saying, uh, do they seem to be emergent or floating? Um, this allows us to do national comparisons with the data. But we also go out with augers. You can see uh, the people wrapped up very warm that day. Um, we're having a go. And we were looking at what was underneath them. Some of these ponds um, sit because of the way the ice deposits around them. They sit surrounded by clay and it acts as its own natural pond liner which means that a lot of them are not fed by groundwater. So they have just their own tiny little rainwater catchment. But working out what's underneath them takes a little bit of doing. So we have something that either looks like a giant corkscrew or looks very much like the kind of um, th thing you see people testing Stilton with, that they push into the Stilton, swirl it around and smell it. It's like that, but again, as big as a person. And we use them to sample the ground underneath. Um, fantastic volunteers go out and they record all these, do us a little pond sketch, um, and it allows us to build up a bigger picture. And in many cases go, wow, how did we not know this pond was here? This is amazing. But they're not the only kind. Finding those ponds takes time. So we've done all sorts of other kinds of surveys. Um, we've done lots of training. You can pe see people here, they're doing their pond dipping, learning about what kind of plants, animals and uh, invertebrates they can see in it. Um, we kept a record of them. Some very detailed surveys have been done on that. Um, there's a great picture here of Will examining um, numerous tiny little mud snails. As David said, they are really small. Um, we do water quality testing. So we're looking to see um, how, 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 what kind of quality the water is, what's in it. Um, is, are there phosphates, nitrates? We're looking for its pH. 
different because of the way these ponds form each one can be isolated so even when very close together they can all have different water qualities and different in fact different ph's which makes quite a big difference about what kind of thing will live in there um, and we've got some fancy gadgets you put in um, that can measure that we were also very excited to be looking for peat um, we had some fantastic uh, students um, from the university of birmingham come out uh, and they took this uh, very large auger uh, this is a Dutch auger. It's, you know, uh, three foot uh, plus handles. Um, and they were looking for peat. We get really excited. When we talk about these ponds existing in the landscape for a long period of time, it, one of the reasons we know they were there is because of the peat. Um, peat forms, depends on the weather around it and things, but in general, you can imagine a millimetre for every 10 years. So if you go to a pond and you find eight metres of sediment and peat, you've got a pond that has been in the landscape for thousands of years. Not only that, peat that's been waterlogged and stays wet, doesn't have much oxygen in, um, means we we're able to find um, carbon remains, bits of woody stem, uh, tree and plant, and they can be dated. Uh, that allows us to say this plant, this pond has been here for this period of time and this depth of peat. Um, allows you to kind of create a profile. Not only that, the peat can preserve pollen, which allows us to work out what kind of plants were in the vicinity at those various points in time. And we can look at how our landscape has changed um, over the last 12 or so thousand years. It's really exciting to do. Not all peat has been marked on the maps. I showed you the map of Moccas and said these are all marked as peat. Many of our other ponds do not have any peat marked. And then we take our auger in and find peat. And we can suddenly say this pond has been here a really long time. Um, it's existed. It's a natural pond being where a pond wants to be. And quite often it's then full of the things that live in ponds because they're where they're the kind of environment they were looking for. So we do get very excited when we find peat and we've had surveys done for that. Um, we, in order to work out which sites you're going to survey, um, just saying, is it a pond, isn't necessarily helpful. Firstly, there aren't any universal lists of every pond in the county, although we are now getting there. Um, so we had amazing volunteers who, during the very first lockdown, which was just as we got our money and just as we wanted to go out into the real world and start looking for ponds, we all stayed at home very sensibly and some fantastic volunteers with amazing amounts of patience sat and looked at the first edition ordnance survey maps carefully in their house and they looked for every single pond within the areas of Fumaki Moraine that we were looking for. And they just did a little dot and gave us a grid reference. And they did it for the entire area, patiently. They then looked at modern maps and did it again and said, little dot, there's a pond, little dot, there's a pond. And a lot of them then went through and looked at satellite imagery. And what we were trying to see was we can't instantly say a pond is really old. But if you're finding a pond on the first edition or ordnance survey map produced in the 1880s and it's still there on the modern ordnance survey map there's a good chance you've got a pond that's at least 120 130 more years old um, and it's a good place to start we can't go back in time the maps are not foolproof we've definitely got examples of ponds that we know are 8,000 years old or, or more um, that weren't marked on any map and other examples of ponds which we think should have, shouldn't have been marked because they're obviously modern, but it gave us a starting point. Um, different lots of fabulous volunteers. When we then went into yet more lockdowns, but this time we we're allowed to leave the house for exercise, fantastically went out. And from this original group of ponds, they identified nearly 1600 potential Ice Age ponds. Narrowing that down to the ones you're gonna do the detailed surveys on and measure and work out what kind of plants takes time. So the next thing they did, another set of wonderful volunteers, was they went on every public right of way, footpath, bridleways, and along little tracks. And they went to each of the sites where you can see the dots on this map and said, can we still see a pond? And they were just saying, is it still there? Have we lost any of them? And the answer is, unfortunately, but not unexpectedly, yeah, quite a few weren't mar were marked in as historic maps, don't appear to be there now. Sometimes there's no sign that there ever was a pond and we think the person doing the first edition made it up. Other times there's still a pond. We don't know why the Ordnance Survey missed it off, but they went through and from that, they whittled down that 1600. They visited um, 
bearing in mind they were only staying on footpaths, so a lot of them they just couldn't get to, they visited over 600 of these ponds. And we then sat with a massive list and set about working out which ones would we be able to get landowners to give us permission to survey and fill in those more detailed forms. And they went through and they did them. They were fantastic. Um, we've still got some more of these forms to fill in. We've still got landowners we're approaching. So we are still looking for volunteers if you fancy learning all about pond surveys. The other thing we've been doing, because we've really been looking in depth into these ponds, is water surveying. Um, and what we're doing at this point is we wanted to know more. When we visit a pond, most of the studies done across the world, at, in not just the UK, but across the world, tend to visit things that are more like Titley Pool and bigger. They are quite big. They're still a pond. They're not full on lake, but they're fairly large. And the vast majority of them don't dry up over summer. Most of the reason they don't study these is they're not that, that common. Um, but the result of that is we've got these ponds that don't really seem to fit the same pattern as everyone else. And we needed to know more about the water quality in them, because if a pond is drying up and filling up, whether it's spring fed or just catchment fed, um, seems to start to be quite an important piece of information. So uh, fantastic, more fantastic volunteers um, went to 20 ponds across the area and they visited them and they had to collect water samples and do some collect some data on site. And they only were able to do it. They had a day and a half to do the sampling. And then they drove to Birmingham and they were processed in a lab in Birmingham because they have to be put through the processing machine first thing the next day, um, because once they've been collected, the samples start to degrade and change. And these were really exciting because this started to tell us more about what kind of pollution you're finding, um, not in real detail. And we were starting to say, well, do these pictures match up with other ones? Although we did choose ponds that we thought stood a chance of being wet most of the year, um, a lot of them did shrink. And it enabled us to say, well, what is what do we think could be causing the pollution? What can we actually see? And this kind of research has never been done before as far as any of us around. We've spoken to lots of experts in this field. Um, because Herefordshire is a little bit sideways and these ponds are, as we said before, really unusual just, just for existing in themselves and still being here, um, they've just never been studied. So it's really exciting results we're getting out of that now. Um, and these are two of the people who went out and did it. Has to be said, this picture was not taken on the horrendous torrential rain that they were forced to do it. Um, they were very long days and they were really impressive volunteers for keeping going. So we did those kind of surveys. Now, go on. Yay. And then we did some geophysics surveys. As I said, no one's done any research on these. We have really tried to cover all the bases. Um, this was quite exciting. As part of the project, we were able to support an MSc student from the University of Kiel. And we said, if we help you cover the costs of coming out and doing your field work, will you come and investigate these ponds for us? And uh, this student, she's called Olivia, she's great, um, and is busy frantically writing up her thesis as we speak. Um, came across and what she was really interested in and indeed her lectures were was those three different landscapes and three different types of ponds because it's not really been written about they've always just been described as being kettle holes actually looking at them it was clear that that wasn't the case so we did some geophysical surveys to see if we could find out what was beneath the landscape so what's actually happening directly underneath the grass um, it's hard to build up that bigger picture um, we used Mm, ah, I have to get the right of this, ground penetrating radar and electrical resistivity tomography, um, both of which is very time team, but you're looking a bit deeper, very much like the archaeologists would use. Um, and in doing so, we were able to build up a picture of actually what's happening right the way across the basins and the ground surrounding these wet pondy areas. We actually did it in summer. And unlike the water sampling where you really need water, so you want ponds that don't dry out, Electrical resistivity tomography really doesn't like being wet. So you can only do it on ponds that are dry um, or at least fairly solid. I say fairly solid. I did lose my wellies in one of the ponds as we took all the kit over. With. Um, but what we're, um, we're just waiting for the final bits of information about it. But one of the things she was doing was having done these studies, which again, have not been done. This is totally new for the area. Um, and she was able to contrast them against each other and indeed look at the data and compare it with what you find 
at modern ice sites. So looking at Alaska, Svalbard, North Russia, Iceland, and actually saying, do what we see on the ground now match the kind of features? Can we see how they compare? Um, her dissertation or thesis is due in next week and we cannot wait to see it. We keep getting snippets and pictures and we're really looking forward to the results of that. Um, but it's very new and exciting research that just hasn't been done before. And that's one of the nice things about this project is that we're really doing some real, not just science, but research on things that have been wildly overlooked, which is a shame because once we started looking for these ponds, as the volunteers who found 1600 will tell you, once you start looking, these ponds are everywhere. And just to give you an idea, um, I know we've mentioned it a few times about how many ponds you get and also why we've used lots of different types of data and surveys. Um, this is a piece of work we did with the University of Worcester. And what we got them to do was we said, we really want to know kind of what the landscape's doing. Are we missing ponds that we can't see? They're not mapped on ordnance survey maps or satellite data and LIDAR data. And we wanted some way of interpreting it. And what Fleur did well, she looked at different data sources. So the first one you can hear, see, are the pale, pale blue, uh, very, very much splodgy. Those are Ordnance Survey ponds. So those are the ponds that the Ordnance Survey have marked on being on modern maps. That's these ones. So you can see this one here. You've got a nice round one here, this long one. And you can see there's quite a few. Then what Fleur did was look at satellite data. Now, in this case, it's LIDAR data. It's very James Bond. They're lasers from planes. And what she was looking for, um, you're able to program the zeros and ones. It's not something I could do, but Fleur's great at this kind of thing. Um, look at the data and say her criteria was, can you fill in the blocks where we get a difference of a meter and that the loop is it's a closed basin? And so it's not just open in the landscape, because obviously that would cover everything. Now, what that showed up was these kind of very mid blue things, the kind of very sort of square shapes. But you'll notice that we start getting ones kind of this one here and this large one here. They are not picked up on the Ordnance Survey. So we start thinking, well, either there's no water in them, which is possible, or these ponds just haven't been mapped which does seem to be the case. And then finally, the last part of the data that's really important is those walking surveys and people just strolling along the street. And us, when we do events like this, when we've done training days and people come to us and go, I walk around that area and I know this field with loads of ponds in, or I've got a farm and I've got ponds on my farm and it's in the area and they sound like they match. And you can see these blue dots here. This is just one field. It's actually newly purchased as a result of the uh, Ice Age Ponds project. And in just one field, um, there are four Ice Age Ponds. And there's actually a fifth depression that doesn't hold water, also a kettle hole. And we wouldn't have found them except for the fact that a volunteer came past and said, I'm sure there's some of those in the field next to us. They aren't picked up by the Ordnance Survey, even though they're definite ponds and three of them are there most of the year and they weren't picked up by the satellite data. So it's quite exciting to mix all those data together and start to see just how many of these depressions. This is a small area of Norton Cannon, and you can start to see that, as David said, there are lots of ponds really close together. And where you get that, stuff can migrate between them. It provides a much better habitat, and because each of these ponds is likely to be a bit more biodiverse, you've suddenly created this really big pond feature within the landscape. And again, a lot of these are natural ponds. So that's why we've used all the different types of data together. Uh, this is the satellite. Ah, go back. This is the satellite image of that area. And you can start seeing, I don't know if you can spot, pond, 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 pond. This bit's a little bit dubious. It's probably a wet patch some of the year, but pond, 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 pond. They start, once you start looking, they're everywhere. So after all this research, although it is still ongoing, we've got huge amounts of survey data. These are great unwieldy spreadsheets. But what we're starting to do now is with the water sampling data and the size data and land use data about what's going on, start saying, can we see any patterns and trends? Are there areas where there are lots of ponds or areas where there aren't? Do some of these ponds seem to dry up? Do we find places where 
we might see more examples of really nice biodiverse ponds. Are there areas where we found nice ponds, but they're just not biodiverse? Um, and this is um, what we're starting to evaluate now. We're also getting that wonderful peak core I showed you um, was taken in uh, one of the sites. Um, it's really exciting. We've had it dated. Um, and this has started to tell us an awful lot. Um, we know that at the 27 centimetres, so that's nearly a foot down, um, it's dated to 4,444 years before present. So BC, there's lots of dates on these forms. Um, BC, then we go to a meet, uh, just over a metre, one metre, 10 centimetres. Uh, at this point, it's dated at about 6,500 BC. And then finally, at two metres down, one metre 90, uh, on this pond, just as a result of this, um, they got a date of 8,400 BC. Now, those dates show you just how old these ponds are. That is a pond on a working farm that's not mapped on any Ordnance Survey map ever. Um, and it was only because the landowner came and went, not a pond, we nearly lost a digger in it. And we went, can we come and have a look? Turned out she got loads of ponds on the land, fantastic landowner. Um, and this is really exciting. The pollen is now being matched and we're bringing that together as new data. So we'll start to be able to date the changes in that story. There are very few radiocarbon dates from Herefordshire. So we're really starting to build up a picture of what happened after that ice retreated. How did that story develop? How did the landscape get from what that barren, and it would have been very barren because the ice has left pretty much got rid of everything. How did it go from that to what the wonderful landscape we see today? How's it developed? How's it changed? Um, so we're using all these kind of different bits of data to bring together that story. It's helping us talk about management. It's helping us spread the word. It's helping us realize that there seems to be a lot of phosphate in quite a lot of these ponds, but actually nitrates really don't seem to be that big a problem. I'm not saying there's no issues. Occasionally we get some, but it starts to help you build up the picture of, is it a certain area? It things everywhere. And this kind of information over such a large area just didn't exist previously. So we've done the standard surveys. That's the general, um, how big is it? What can we see? Um, we've done 104 ponds. We've still got a few more to go. Always keen to get new people involved. We've written 17 management plans. So these were our suggestions, how you could improve, look after and maintain these into the future. Unfortunately, as David mentioned, across the country, the general statistic is that 80% are in poor condition. In many cases, um, this is because people either don't know how or just haven't managed the ponds. Often just clearing away the overgrown vegetation does wonders for their biodiversity. We've um, done active management. This is the clearing following those ideas on 15 ponds. I know David's going to talk more about that. Our um, ecologists have done really detailed surveys, the kind of survey where they found that Agabus angelatus. Um, they've really gone in and identified everything they found um, on 20 ponds. Um, this is fantastic for picking up those rare species, the species we don't find everywhere else, um, whether it's spotting the different plants or the different animals, the tiny little beetles and indeed mud snails. Um, we're currently in the process of right, we've got five what we call legacy management plans. These are plans that are for the future going forward. We won't be doing the work, but as we've gone through this and we keep finding more and more of these ponds, there are certain ponds we said we'd really like to uh, write management plans to help the landowners manage them themselves. And as I mentioned, we've done the seasonal water quality sampling of 20 ponds. I reckon David is now going to go into more detail about some of those features. Thank you, Beth. So this is an example of one of the management plans that was written for, again, Lawn Pool at Mockers Park, which you've seen images of. That's the front page. And this is an example of just a part of a species list. These, these all happen to be water beetles, our ecologists in particular, um, uh, experts on water beetles. So you can see from that just small part of it, how many of those individual species are vulnerable, nationally scarce, near threatened. So, um, the, you know, the assemblage of, of uh, animals in those ponds is really quite amazing. And at the end of, um, of the plans, um, there is a, a uh, first of all, a map showing the existing situation and then a map suggesting management. And in this case, it's mainly about coppicing and repollarding trees to, to open up, uh, allow more light into the ponds. And, and um, essentially, <clears throat> although, you know, it's not a thing one thinks of doing uh, for conservation these days, felling trees, but 
from this point of view, um, we would, we're sort of mimicking what would have happened thousands of years ago when mammoths and elk and auroch were wandering around and beavers, they would have been knocking over trees and, and pond water bodies like this would have been kept much more open than they are now. So we're in a sort of an artificial situation um, where there's nothing actually controlling those trees. And often, you know, where there is no such control, these ponds get very, very over, over um, shadowed and the, the habitat um, suffers. So um, a number of, we found a number of landowners that were, 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 were A, interested in their ponds and also willing to have some management carried out for them. So funded by the lottery, um, we um, uh, commissioned uh, contractors to come and uh, do this pollarding around the ponds. And that, that left-hand one is actually at, uh, at Cannon Bridge, uh, quite recently done this autumn um, and the one on the right that's at, at Lower Blakemere that was done um, in 2020. So we've done um, management work on, on 15 of these ponds including pollarding, coppicing and uh, removal uh, as well as uh, we'll be removing fish from at least one of the ponds because we've identified the fact that um, because carp were put in the, in the pond um, a decade ago or so that's having a detrimental effect on the on the other invertebrates in the pond. Um, that's another pond where we did some management clearance around it and you can see scattered around the edge of the um, of that pond there it's very characteristic um, um, one of these things that, that uh, Beth was talking about these um, meltwater channels lots of um, rounded and sub-rounded and slightly angular rocks there a lot of which have been brought miles from uh, from the well from Wales and, and areas like that. So erratics that are actually brought by the glacier um, in the in the flowing waters and in the ice. Um, another example of pollarding at um, at uh, Court Farm at Kenchester, and this is um, restoring these the ghost ponds. This um, uh, the one in the pictures, Beth at the bottom of um, of the of the. Of what we th of what is a, a ghost pond? Essentially, these are ponds which we think have been uh, filled in by um, either by the artificially by by farming activities or by natural processes. And we carefully by looking at the um, looking at the colour of the soil, work out where the original um, profile of the pond was, and um, and scraping down with the attempt um, at with the with the idea an ideal of getting to a layer of peat where we would we would just go down to the layer of peat in the hope that um, there is an off chance that um, um, buried seeds that have been there for, for, for some time may have a chance of, of, of germinating. Um, so this was a very interesting process and actually just where Beth has stood there about 50 centimetres below there is, is a layer of peat which was quite a, an interesting and, and um, unexpected find in that particular area. But it does prove that that was indeed um, a pond uh, for thousands of years. Um, this is, so that's what that looks, a few days ago it was looking like that. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, um, the, um, the sort of brown areas, we, we did this in August and then the, the um, farmer had about 200 sheep on the site and just about every one of those sheep um, decided that the clay, exposed clay, was nice and warm and they laid there overnight and did what sheep do. So it resulted in rather a lot of, um, of uh, nutrient enrichment, which I was very unhappy about. Um, but I think since, well, since that happened, there's been a flood up to about a foot over that, so the dilution factor of um, of that water uh, is it hopefully has got um, reduced the nutrient level in that, and it's looking a lot cleaner now since that happened. But in in a this so this this is barely it hasn't had a season yet, so give that a season in the summer, um, which that should be um, very interesting in terms of improved biodiversity. And this is another example. Um, where we, um, the maps and all the intelligence um, led us to believe that there could well be a, 
an ice age pond under here. And this is more of a story about working with farmers and landowners uh, in improving biodiversity. Yeah, like that. You wouldn't think they might think that it, there's um, one of them. It turns on somebody's sample. Um, <coughs> yeah, I managed to get a picture of that. I just... um, yeah, sorry, somebody was talking in the background there. Um, so yes, this is a this was a um, a farmer's field, the edge of which, for more often than late than often than not laid wet, didn't produce much of a crop. So he was more than happy for us to to explore um, putting a, a pond in, trying to re uh, restore a ghost pond. We were um, we didn't actually find um, any peat in there, but there, there was lots of evidence of it being a, a very much a moraine. But what we have ended up with, and the farmers ended up with, is, is a is a new pond, which that's um, still that's only a, a few days old there. So that will eventually fill up with water after when we finally get some rain, and um, that will be a, an absolutely superb hotspot for wildlife in a few years time. And it's, it's a very good story about um, working with farmers and improving the biodiversity of that particular area of, of his farm. So um, one of the very important things about um, this project and um, one of the reasons um, we get lottery funding is telling people about ice age ponds and, and uh, informing people, getting people involved. So we have a number of ways of doing that. We've um, created an app, I'll tell you more about that later. Um, we're doing um, a, uh, there's already a, a geocache trail put down. Um, and if you're interested in that sort of thing, you can go to the geocache website and find out all about it. And this takes you to some very interesting places in Herefordshire, most of which are associated with Ice Age ponds. New interpretation boards, more of that later, and also um, leaflets, uh, lots of information on the website. We've been going to be producing a book, which is a, a, a summary of, of all the information we found on the project. Um, quite a few community events, events and activities. Um, just basically trying to involve as many people as possible and spreading the word. This is a relatively recently produced, still in draft form of a, um, a trail route for the Sturts Nature Reserve. So it but it's essentially follows the route of the of the app, tells you about the reserves, it tells you of the reserves in, in general, it tells you about the where the where the ghost where the ice age ponds are and, and how to find them and uh, lead you around the reserve. And this is, uh, again, a, this is going to be an interpretation board in the car park, which covers similar sort of ground. This is a, um, we will also be having some more generic um, boards, which we can put up at uh, places where, um, that aren't necessarily on um, reserves that, for instance, the Wildlife Trust owns, but on private land. This one was um, a very specific one produced um, for uh, an, an owner of a pond where we'd done some work and he was, we'd done some pollarding around a pond that he, he wanted, he thought it would be a very good idea, as did I, um, to um, to put a sign up explaining what what was uh, what was going on and why we'd cut these trees down and it also happened to be on a public footpath so this has been produced and we'll put it up next to the footpath so that people can understand what we've been doing education this is what it's all about isn't it informing young people about the importance of of wildlife um the environment and that was a, a very obvious thing we did so we've been into um schools in in the area um, in this last year, in 2021, nine sessions in seven schools. So 156 um, people were, uh, uh, kids were attended the, the, um, the, the classes and five schools during the development stage. So um, always, the kids always love to, to, to dip in a pond and also learn about the ice age. And one of the things it's quite easy to do if you do an assemb assembly with, um, with uh, primary school children is, is you ask them, if, if they know who the who, what the mammoth in the film Ice Age is called, and they all put up their hands and they say it's Manny, it's Manny, and you can you sort of got them then, and you can talk, start talking about the fact that where their school is used to be covered in ice. Um, we also had um, an, an exhibition in um, the Hereford uh, Museum and Art Gallery 
they had a, an Ice Age exhibition and we had a section of it um, involved, uh, which was dedicated to the Ice Age Ponds project. And Beth and I had the very great pleasure of moving that mammoth in the picture um, from Dudley, um, the, uh, from du we picked it up in du from Dudley, took it to bits, put it in the back of a, of a transit van, brought it to Hereford and put it back up again in the, in the museum, you know, which was um, quite fun. This is, um, this is what the app looks like. It's available. I'll give you the, the, the where to download it if you're interested in this sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> so you can get that on your phone. You can you can follow various trails both around reserves and also um, car or or bike tours, and they'll they'll guide you around the the landscape and explain and interpret what what that landscape looked like, <clears throat> how it was formed, and how the ice age affected it, and um, also takes you to a number of ponds where you can find out about the wildlife. And also, if you don't want to um, uh, use your phone, you can actually follow these routes on a website on your on your laptop or computer by going to this site, it is iceageponds.org. And this has lots of information, including all of the walks. Uh, you can download the app if you want to. Um, so that's a, that's a very interesting site. This is an example of one of the leaflets that we've produced, which is um, aimed at farmers and landowners. A very brief guide to um, to to Hereford, Hereford's to Ice Age ponds and how to look after them. So very simple: do a few do's and don'ts, why they're important, where they are, and what to do if you've got one, what not to do if you've got one. Also, spreading the world with the word. Um, uh, the BBC are often um, interested in coming along and, and hearing about the story. So we've done a few um, bits bits and pieces to camera. This is um, um, early on in the project in August 2020, where they came to Croft Castle and we, we did a piece with them there. These are our, um, our lovely volunteers, our trainees actually. We had, we've um, actually got one now, but we've had three, vol three trainees in the past, volunteer trainees. And these guys uh, were involved in doing the surveys, organizing um, uh, the, uh, the water surveys, organizing the, vol the other volunteers to go on surveys. And this was taken at uh, Mockers Park when we had, that's Justin Rowlett in the background, who's the BBC, he's actually BBC um, um, climate change correspondent at the moment. He was head of environment, chief environment co correspondent at the time. And we did a, a bit of filming at Mockers Park and that went out on uh, BBC Breakfast. And this is um, Ian Fairchild, Professor Ian Fairchild, who's the um, chair of the Earth Heritage Trust, explaining um, how mammoths dance. No, he was explaining to, um, to Phoebe Weston, who works with The Guardian, about the importance of Ice Age ponds, and that, that resulted in a, quite a big article in The Guardian. Um, we've also quite recently just completed a film of... Um, of Telling the telling the story about the Ice Age ponds, Ice Age ponds, and the and the Ice Age ponds project, um, and that hopefully will be ready. I think the first drafts will be ready this this week, and then we can put it out on on YouTube, and you can have a look at that. I'm very interested to see that. So, what next? And Beth can join in on this one because this is this is all all important. It's about uh, what happens next. Um, and in summary, we would love more people to get involved. We'd like to train people how to, to survey the ponds. Um, I'll give you some um, contact numbers later on. Um, so we need to, uh, we've got a target, a target of doing 20 more ponds this spring, but we'd like to break that target. So that involves contacting new landowners, or finding the ponds in the first place, finding out who owns them, then going and visiting them. Um, we're also going to be analysing and sharing the results, so that, the, that data that we've collected, um, we're going to be sharing that with uh, on a database which compares our ponds with the national picture. So we should be able to get an idea of, 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 um, of how they compare in terms of diversity and water quality, etc. Um, crucially, we, we, we are aiming to recruit and um, infuse and train some pond champions who can be anybody from a, a landowner that has a pond on his own land, or, um, a, a village, a 
anybody that knows of a pond and wants to look after it. Um, uh, people that want to go and do active work on ponds, um, people that want to do recording with experts and, and on, on a regular basis. So all sorts of things. And we'll be having a um, firstly an online uh, meeting in a few weeks time to to uh, to let people know how they can help and the sort of the sort of things we, we'd like them to do, but also get people's ideas on what they would like to do. Um, we're going to be well, pr pr we're promoting the app at the moment. In fact, Beth was um, at Sturtson this morning with uh, Nicola, um, what's she called? Goodwin. Nicola, Nicola Goodwin. Um, and she, you'll hear, if you tune into BBC Radio Hereford and Worcester tomorrow morning, there will be several pieces and you'll be able to hear Beth squelching through the ponds at, uh, at Sturt. Um, yeah, so we're also going to be sharing the results with the stakeholders. A lot of, um, a lot of the people whose ponds we visited uh, you know, very interested to hear, particularly on the water quality side of things, um, uh, um, the, the results of what we've been doing. Um, lobbying for improved protection. That's, this is a long, a long haul, but um, things like um, our, our project ecologist has already written to, our, to, to the local MP for, um, to, to try and raise the importance of and protection of ice age ponds. Um, and one of the things that we're, that, that what can help with that is is to prioritize these sorts of ponds in the various schemes and grants that are available to landowners for looking after their land and particularly for um, for, for uh, looking after ponds. We've got a, an end of project conference coming up on the 2nd of March and we've got some interesting speakers coming to to, to speak at that. It's um, in person at um, the Three Counties Hotel in Hereford and also online so anybody can come along and, and join it online um, without having to leave the comfort of your own home. Um, Ponds for the Future project, that's not, there's not, that's not a particular um, uh, set in stone name but it's something that I'm very keen on in terms of um, getting a follow on project for, for this project, working on all the, the groundwork that we've been um, creating for the last two years. Um, and sort of continuing this work, finding out more about ponds, finding more ponds, protecting more ponds, getting more landowners and people interested in them, because the end of the project is in May coming up. So um, it's very important that we try and do that. Ed, you, anything, any other thoughts on that, Beth? No, no, that's, we, 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 we've met lots of people, we've spoken, we've researched, and uh, now we're just keen to share and keep the um, enthusiasm going because these are unusual features and uh, we think that more people should know just how special they are because they're not found everywhere although there are a lot of them they're very much concentrated in a small area and it is important um, especially for the ones that don't fit the standard picture of pond um, the ones that are actually grass most of the year are really exciting and the more people we can tell that they are not just a pond but a really unusual old type of pond that are very valuable, the better. Um, and as we said a few times during this, um, there are a few places you can go to find out more. I know we've been talking at you um, and we're very grateful that you've uh, given up some evening to listen to us. But if you visit the Herefordshire Wildlife Trust website, um, there is a whole load of stuff about the project. You can listen to some of our talks that we've done previously. You can see the exhibition we had at the museum. You can um, read quite a lot of our blog reports. Our wonderful um, it, uh, trainees have done loads of stuff that go into more detail about different bits and what they're like and why you'd be interested. Um, if you want to get involved, you want to volunteer, you want to attend one of our events, uh, that's a good place to start. You can email David um, or visit the website and you can see the contact details there. Um, you can also donate to the project, uh, join one of the organisations involved. Um, if you want to find out more about that app, you want an idea of what it's like to visit those ponds, what it's like to walk around them, um, iceagepond.org is a great place to start. The routes, the pictures, you can find out what the words are, get an idea of what you'd see. Um, we wanted to make sure that people weren't hindered by not being able to get out and about to those places and make this available to as many people as possible in as many different ways. Um, so yeah, do get in touch with us if you're interested or if you've got a pond or you know someone who's got a pond, um, let us know because we are interested in finding yet more ponds. Um, we really are trying to get out and cover as wide an area as possible. 
Um, I'm just trying to unmute everybody now. Anyway, let's go to that one. So thank you all very much for listening. Um, and <clears throat> I will then I'll put the next um, screen up, which had all that other information. And I'll try and unmute you all so that we can talk to each other. How do I do that? I'm going to ignore the telephone. Terrible timing. While David tries to unmute everyone, I'm going to go through some of the questions that people have asked um, oh, about the ponds. Uh, so um, one of them is, what is it about ponds on Bromyard? Uh, oh, hang on, one for that. Uh, how much of a threat are invasive species? They are. Um, they could be a big threat. Um, one of the things we ask when we get our volunteers to do the survey, um, one of the things we give them is loads of guides about the most common invasive species and how to spot them. And we say, did you see them? Um, we're really keen on what's called biosecurity, which is cleaning your boots between ponds, really, so that should you tread in something, you don't then take it to the next pond you survey or take it home or visit anywhere else. Um, they can be really serious. And there are examples uh, across the country um, where ponds have, um, well, not vanished, but very much they become almost a monoculture because they're totally um, overwhelmed by these invasive species. I'm pleased to say that within Herefordshire itself, they're not actually that much of a problem. We are finding them. I'm not going to pretend that they're not there. Um, but in the main, we're not finding lots and lots of them. Um, so I'm pleased to say that. I think that is constant vigilance, which sounds very dramatic. But it is a case of where they're found, making sure they're very difficult to get rid of. Um, but if you can stop them spreading from one place to another, certainly by human intervention. So where we've had diggers or volunteers going out on site, making sure that those diggers don't go to another site and spread something. So we do keep our eyes open. Um, some of the stuff we can't do. Um, but by identifying them, we can kind of monitor the spread. And also in certain cases, there are some things you can do with different types of invasive species in order to get rid of them. But in general, from the ones we've met, um, we've not had too much of problem with that um someone uh brenda allen you asked about the ponds on bromyard downs and brinksty common they're not ice age ponds they're very nice ponds but they're not ice age so they're worth preserving but they uh, are much more recently they're man-made ponds in this case um oh. they are much further along uh they were never covered by ice and no. we want to say that one of the things about these is where ponds are hugely important, however they were formed in any any environment, they are going to be really significant. Um, but uh, the ones that this project is focusing on, because you can't just look at all ponds everywhere, um, we've got found hundreds and uh, have enjoyed visiting them. Um, and we hope that, as David says, the Ponds for the Future starts to look at more ponds across a wider area. But yeah, the ice actually stopped just about level with Hereford and it didn't get any further over. Um, so they're not Ice Age. Still interesting, but not okay. Ice Age. Thanks very much. Um, Jean Pascal asks, were, and do the ponds have marl deposits and have they changed as marl was extracted? No, these ponds um, haven't been filled up with marl. They, uh, where you get uh, marl, you don't get peat and Ice Age deposits in that same way. So they haven't changed. Although, that said, lots of these ponds have been dug out. Um, either, because as I've said a few times, they don't stay wet all year. So you've kind of got this bit of land that's a bit wet in winter and a bit dry in summer. Um, and a lot of them uh, landowners have, for obvious reasons, thought, well, my field's kind of boggy. If I dig this bit out, that'll be the pond and um, it'll stay wetter for longer and be good for cattle mm. and things. So we do get them dug out. It does change them. Um, in some cases, this is just people managing land. That's what they've done for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, it gives us the landscape we have today. Um, we try and ask people nicely, if possible, not to dig them out to the peat level. Um, and, and these ponds that do dry out over summer, we just try and say, I know it doesn't look like much, but really important for wildlife. So if you can just leave it be, in many cases, keep grazing it, keep treating it like grass in summer, leave it be the rest of the time. Um, it's a really important feature. Um, so that was the thing about marl. Um, you do find, because a lot of them are surrounded by clay, um, that especially in the Letton area, you've got the ponds that are Ice Age and right next to them are brick ponds, which is where there wasn't an Ice Age pond, but there was really nice brick clay. Um, and one of the things is, although they don't necessarily have the peat deposits, because you've got lots of ponds close together, which is fantastically important for wildlife to be able to move about, 
those ponds are often very biodiverse as well because they've got all these neighboring ponds that have been around for a long time with lots of lovely things living in them and they're able to move between them so we would never say that a new pond is bad especially when they're near the old ones it can help uh, allow them to mingle um i'm glad lots of people are saying very nice things about how much you've enjoyed it um what do we say to landowners to filling them in well I can understand why they're doing it. In many cases, when we've spoken to landowners, they've been really receptive. One of the things is, as we said at the beginning, um, it captures the imagination. These ponds are really old, but that is not what leaps to mind. Um, even as a geologist who knows about these ponds, when you see them the first time, and when I see ponds in a new area, I'm not thinking, I wonder if this pond is more than 10,000 years old, because that's not the story, it's not that common. So for a lot of them, these ponds, these wet areas, they're just managing the land and they just didn't know. And when you say, actually, this particular site, a lot of them are really interested. So while we do, we don't have the authority and it's not a great way to work with people, um, we try and help encourage them to look after them. We try and say, please don't fill them in. Where they're protected, we report them. If those sites are sites of special scientific interest or they're protected at another level, we do tend to take that up because that is a wildlife crime. Um, so we do raise that. Um, I'm thankful to say, like we said, it's not that common in that serious way. But in a lot of cases, it's just a case of meeting someone and saying, um, this, is what's, this is what you've got. And a lot of them didn't know. I mean, time and time again, they've gone, it's just a pond on our field. Just thought someone before had dug it. And we've gone, no, this is fantastic. And they're excited and proud of what they've got. So a lot of them are not still filling them in. And especially if we find them, they tend to say, okay, how can we manage them? What can we do? How can we look after them? So in general, I'm not going to say every single landowner uh, is like that, but the majority of them have managed them uh, because they're managing their land. And once we've said what they've got, which is not intuitive, they've been really receptive. Some more so than others, but in general, people have been really positive. And the more people we can tell, this could be exciting. And in many cases, doing nothing or doing very little is actually what they want. So, yeah, we, we, the more we, people we can educate and tell them and help spread the word that they could exist and they are exciting, the better. Um, but, yeah, um, mm -hmm. the draining the wet areas around them, I understand why they're doing it. We try very nicely to suggest that maybe that wouldn't be such a good idea, but in the end, it is kind of up to them. There is, there um, is hope on the horizon with the new with um, agri-environment schemes and the grants are very much the flavour of the month is, and hopefully ongoing to farmers in particular, is the, 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 the subsidies that they're getting um, are for biodiversity improvements, for carbon capture. And if you've got a piece of wet land on your, on your land, you might be better off in some cases managing it for wildlife and conservation and carbon capture than you would try to drain it and growing a crop. It's it's marginal. It does depend on the the attitude of, of the landowner, but um, there are you know th th things are sl slowly changing and attitudes in farming. I think are slowly changing to to encourage people to to not necessarily think all the time about about production where where production is. And this, where huge amounts of inputs are, are necessary for production and where you might think about other public goods, as they call them, uh, by by leaving the land in, in, in that state and encouraging biodiversity. So we're getting there slowly, whether it's going to be fast enough for the planet, we're not entirely sure. Um, okay. I think I've got to the end of the questions. If I know that we've been here a long time and I'm guessing people would like a cup of tea. Um, uh, what I say is if you've got um, any questions, don't hesitate to contact us, get in touch with us through the website, email David. Um, I know he'll pass it on to me if it's a geology question and our ecologists otherwise. Um, if you want to volunteer with us, we'd love to see you come along. Um, we do online training and then in person when it gets a little bit warmer. And uh, yeah, we'll, we would be delighted to find out more. And if you've got a pond, please tell us. Um, we like all ponds and we'll do our best to get in touch but if you've got a pond in our project area we'd really like to talk to you <laughs> so thank you ever so much everyone for giving up an evening for us um, we hope you've learned something and uh, we hope to see some of you in the future yeah thank you very much everyone i'll um, be closing it down shortly but thanks ever so much for coming